Next, let's talk about routing. How a host routes, uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about default gateways, IPv4 hosting tables, uh, then we'll get into a little bit to IPv6 as well. Another role of the network layer is to direct packets between hosts, and a host can send a packet to itself. Uh, it can send a packet to a local host or a remote host. And a host can ping itself by sending a packet to a special IPv4 address, the 127.0.0.1, which is referred to as the loopback interface. And the loopback interface address is automatically assigned to a host when TCP IP is running. The ability for a host to send a packet to itself using network functionality is useful for testing purposes. Any IP within the network 127.0.0.0/8 refers to the local host. I've brought up the command prompt on my computer. If I ping 127.0.0.1, you'll see that I've pinged myself and it's going to go out there and run the packets. And it says that there were four packets sent and four packets received and zero lost. So that's one way that you can ping yourself. The local host, this is a host on the same network as the sending host, and the hosts share the same network address. Remote host, this is a host on a remote network, and the hosts the host do not share the same network address. Oh. So whether a packet is destined locally or to itself or to a remote host, IP address and subnet mask combination of the source or sending device is compared to the IP address and subnet mask of the destination device. And we'll get into the subnet and subnetting, uh, I believe, in chapter 7 or 8. So we'll get more into that in the next week or two. In a home or business network, uh, you may have several wired or wireless devices interconnected, so you have a small LAN. Um, you may have a wireless access point. And the intermediate device provides interconnections between your local host on the local network and your local host can reach each other and share information without the need of any additional devices. So um, if the host is sending a packet to a device that is configured with the same IP network as the host device, the packet simply is forwarded out of the host interface through the intermediate device and to the destination device directly. However, if you're headed out to a larger network, you're going to need a default gateway, and that's where it passes it through the router, and your router is considered your default gateway, whichever port you go into the router on. The default gateway is the device that routes traffic from the local network to devices on the remote networks. Uh, in a home or small business environment, the default gateway is often used to connect to the local network to the internet. However, in a business, you're going to have different routers that don't necessarily connect you to the internet. They may connect to other routers as well. Uh, and again, the gateway address is going to be the, the IP address of the port in which the router you're entering. Hosts must maintain their own local routing table to ensure the network layer packets are directed to the correct destination network. And the local table of the host typically contains direct connection, and this is the route to the loopback address. The local network route, uh, this is the network which the host is connected to, is automatically populated in the host routing table. And then you have your local default route. And the default route represents the route the packets must take to reach all remote network addresses. Um, the default route is created when a default gateway address is present on the host. And the default gateway address is the IP address of the network interface of the router that's connected to your local network. Uh, the default gateway address can be configured on the host manually or it can be learned dynamically. It's important to note that the default route 
is only used when a host must forward packets outside of its local network. On a Windows host, the route print or netstat-r commands can be used to display the host routing table. Both commands generate the same output and the output may seem overwhelming at first but is fairly simple to understand. When you enter the netstat-r command or the equivalent route print, you're going to end up with the interface list and this is going to list the media access control address and assigned interface number of every network capable interface on the host including Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth. You'll have your IPv4 route table and that lists all your known IPv4 routes. You'll have your IPv6 route table that lists all the known IPv6 routes and command output varies depending on how the host is configured and interface types it has. Uh, the figure here to the right displays an IPv4 route table section of output and you'll notice that the output is divided into five columns. You have your network destination, your net mask, your gateway, your interface, and your metric. And more, this will make more sense the further we go into the course. You'll notice when I did a netstat-r on my computer, I have my interface list, the IPv4 route table, and the IPv6 route table. Uh, just like it told us through here that we would have. So I did find that information by t simply typing in netstat-r netstat or I could type in route print. and I receive the same information. So either command will work. To help simplify the output, the destination networks can be grouped into five sections as identified by the highlighted areas in the figure. The quad zero or 0.0.0, .0 that's your local default route and all packets with destinations that do not match other specified addresses in your routing table will go out the quad zero route. Uh, it looks at it and says it doesn't match anything here, so it throws it over to the quad zero. Then you have the 127.0.0.0 to 127.255.255.255. This is the loopback addresses, and they all relate to direct connection and provide services to the local host. Your 192.168.10.0 to 192.68.10.255, these addresses are relate to the host and local network, and all packets with destination addresses that fall into this category will exit out of the 192.168.10 interface here in this example. The 192.168.10.0 is the local network route address and it represents all computers on the 192.168.10.x and x is any number from um, 0 to 255 on that network. Okay, so this is a number that they've used here. Another address that you'll see is 224.0.0.0. This is a special multi-class multicast class D address and it's reserved for use through either the loopback interface or the host IP address. Then we have 255.255.255.255 and that's the last two addresses represent the limited broadcast IP address value for use through either the loopback interface or the host IP address. And these addresses can be used to find a DHCP server before the local IP is determined. Example or a sample of how this works, uh, we have a PC and we want to send a packet to 192.168.10.20. What it would do is it would consult its routing table. It would match the destination IP address 
with the 192.168.10.0 network destination. Because it's going to that network because its address is 192.168.10.20. So it's in the 192.168.10 network. PC1 would then send the packet toward the final destination using its local interface. And figure 1 highlights the matched route. If PC1 wanted to send a packet to a remote host located on 10.10.10.10, it would consult its routing table. It doesn't match anything in its routing table, so it would send it out the quad zero um, default. So this is where it's going to go for everything else that's not within its network. With IPv6 routing table, it differs uh, in column headings and format due to the longer IPv6 addresses. You have the if, and that lists the interface numbers from the interface list section of the netstat-r command. And the interface number is considered the network capable interface of host, including Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth. You have your metric, your network destination, and your gateway. And remember that on link indicates that the host is currently connected to it. The figure displays IPv6 route section generated by the netstat-r command to reveal the following network destinations. You have uh, colon colon slash zero. This is the IPv6 equivalent to the local default route or the quad zero route. You have the colon colon 1 slash 128. This is equivalent to the IPv4 6 IPv4 loopback address and provides services to the local host. The 2001 colon colon slash 32. This is the global unicast network prefix. Then we have this global unicast IPv6 address of the local computer. Here's his IPv6 address. Next you have the local link network route address and represents all computers on the local link IPv6 network. Next you have uh, the link local IPv6 address and local computer. That is this information here. And then there's the special reserve multicast class D address equivalent to the IPv4 um, multicast class D address. And a special note here is that interfaces in IPv6 commonly have two IPv6 addresses, a link local address and a global unicast address. You'll also notice that there are no broadcast address in IPv6 and IPv6 addresses will be discussed further in our next chapter. So here we have an activity with identifying elements of the host routing table. So you can scroll through here and work on this activity uh, to help you understand what you're doing there. The router routing table is a little bit different from the host routing table. When a host sends a packet to another host, uh, it may have to go through the route, the router. Um, so what happens when the packet arrives at the router? The router looks at the routing table to determine where to forward the packets. Uh, the routing table of a router stores information about things that are directly connected to the routes. Um, these routes come from the active router interfaces, and routers add a directly connected route when an interface is configured with an IP address and is, is activated. Each of the router's interfaces is connected to different network segments. Uh, <clears throat> routers maintain information about the network segments, segments that they are connected to within the routing table. And then it keeps up with remote routes. Uh, these are the routes that come from a remote network connected to other routers. And routes to these networks can either be manually configured on the local router by the network administrator or dynamically configured 
by enabling the local router to exchange routing information with other routes using dynamic routing protocols. Here in this figure it identifies the directly connected networks and remote networks of Route 1. So you see we have this network, we have this network. They're connected through the different routers. A host routing table uh, includes only information about directly connected networks and a host requires a default gateway to send packets to a de remote destination. Uh, the routing table of a router contains similar information but also identifies specific remote networks. The routing table of a router is similar to the routing table of a host. They both identify the destination network, the metric, and the gateway. When you're on the router and you're at the command line and you've typed in enable, you will type in show IP route command and you can be used to display the routing table of a router. A router also provides additional route information including how the route was learned, when it was last updated, and which specific interface to use to get this predefined destination. The figure to the right shows you the example of what is displayed when there is a show IP route. This one gives you the examples of the different codes. It tells you the different protocols that are being uh, used. You see the gateway of last resort. And you can see the different subnets that are connected and how they're connected. Two routing table entries are automatically created when an active router interface is configured with an IP address and subnet mask. This figure displays the routing table entries on router 1 for the directly connected network 192.168.10.0. The slash 24 means that it's working in the fourth octet. And then we have the local that's 192.168.10.1. That's a slash 32, and it's directly connected as well. <clears throat> Some of the route sources uh, are labeled as A in the figure. It identifies how the route was learned, uh, and it was directly connected interface with the two routes. We have C, which identifies the directly connected network, and L identifies that this is a link local route and the link local routes are automatically created when an interface is configured with an IP address and activated. And you activate an interface with the no shutdown command. The destination network is labeled here as B in the figure and it identifies the address of the remote network. Uh, you have the outgoing interface here that is C, that is where it's going out of. We have the gigabit Ethernet 00 and gigabit 01 on this one. Here on this side, they're both going out of the gigabit 00 in this switch. Um, the outgoing interface is labeled C. It identifies the exit interface to use when forwarding packets to the destination network. The link local routing table entries did not appear in routing tables prior to iOS release 15. The router typically has multiple interfaces configured and the routing table stores information about both directly connected and remote routes. S identifies that the route was manually created by an administrator to reach a specific network. This is, a, is known as a static route. D identifies the route was learned dynamically from another router using the enhanced interior gateway routing protocol, which is called EIGRP. And the O identifies that the route was learned dynamically from another router using the open shortest path first or OSPF routing protocol. There are other codes used, but we're not going to discuss them in this chapter. This figure is going to display a routing table entry on R1 for the route to the remote network 
10.1.1.0 and the entry identifies the following information. You have the route source and that identifies how the route was learned. We have the destination network that identifies the address of the remote network. Next you have their administrative distance that identifies the trustworthiness of the route. That's this one. Then we have the metric and that identifies the value assigned to each to reach the remote network. Lower values indicate preferred routes. Next you have the next hop that identifies the IP address of the next router to forward the packet to. Then you have the route timestamp. It identifies when the route was last heard from. Then you have the outgoing interface and it identifies the exit interface to use to forward a packet toward the final destination. So if we have information coming from this PC needing to route out and come to this PC, then it's going to come out of serial 000. A next hop is the address of the device that will process the, the packet next, not necessarily the endpoint. So for a host on a network, the address of the default gateway or the router interface is your next hop. It's going to come from PC to the gateway, so that's its next hop address. In the routing table of a router, each route to remote network lists a next hop. When a packet is destined from a remote network arrives at the router, the router matches the destination network to a route in its routing table. Uh, if it's found, the route forwards the packet to the IP address of the next hop router using the interface identified by the route entry. And the next hop router is the gateway to the remote networks. Networks directly connected to a router have no next hop addresses because a router can forward packets directly to host on this network using the designated interfaces. So if it's not leaving the router, it doesn't have a next hop. Packets cannot be forwarded by the router without a route for the destination network in the routing table. If the route representing the destination network is not in the table, the packet is dropped. Okay? It is not forwarded. Just as a host can use a default gateway to forward a packet to an unknown destination, a router can also be configured to use a default static route to create a gateway of last resort. Uh, so it basically says if it doesn't match anything here in my routing table, then you're going to send it in this direction. This example to the right is an, shows you that you're going to assume that PC1 with an IP address of 192.168.10.10 wants to send a packet to another host in the same network. So PC1 would check the IPv4 route table based on the destination address and then it would discover that the host is on the same network and simply send it. Here in example one, it wants to verify connectivity to its local default gateway at the 192.168.10.1. That's your router interface. So if you'll go through here, it's going to walk you through the different steps needed. Example 2 shows you that PC1 wants to send a packet to PC2. Example 3 shows you the steps where PC1 wants to send a packet to the 209.165.200.226 IP address. And then step 4 shows you it wants to send a packet to the host with an IP address of 10.1.1.10. So go through these, watch what the steps do. You can scroll down through here. You'll see where they show up in the routing tables. You'll see how they're connected. You need to get familiar with this one. You have the activity on identifying the elements of the router routing table entries. Make sure you understand what each one of those are. And then here we have a lab 